Sydney July event, uh, where we've got uh, John Davis, CEO of the Australian Constructors Association, uh, giving us a presentation today on the case for an Australian construction playbook. I'll introduce John more formally uh, a bit later, just before we get going with the presentation. Uh, but just a few messages. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Pins and Masons, who are our sponsor of, for this event, and are also allowing us to use their uh, WebEx uh, online facility to hold this webinar. Um, this originally was going to be a face-to-face -face, uh, seminar with drinks afterwards in June, but obviously with the uh, COVID situation, we then moved it to July. Uh, ever hoped for that we could have a face to face with drinks again, or obviously with that got scuppered. So we uh, changed it over uh, to a webinar. We have got events lined up for every month uh, through to the end of the year. And we're also holding events uh, in our other chapters in Perth, Melbourne and uh, Brisbane. So those events are on our website, uh, normally a month before they uh, come online. So uh, they're still managing to meet face to face in Brisbane at the moment, but um, I'm not sure how long uh, that will go on for. Um, in uh, August, we've got HKA giving a presentation, but I'll send details out on those uh, after tomorrow. We're just waiting to see what the government announcements are um, tomorrow on lockdown. But I think for August, we could probably all agree we're going to still be in lockdown in Sydney. So we might have to flip that one over uh, to a webinar uh, also. Um, I'm hoping to get some news now going forward in the next couple of months on some of the beneficiaries uh, for the funds that we've raised uh, in, in the Lighthouse Club so far this year. Uh, we've just changed our constitution uh, to allow a bit more flexibility in the choice of our uh, beneficiaries, um, but they do, uh, they are concentric around uh, young adults, uh, getting them a start in the construction industry by providing uh, funding um, you know, for courses um, or for um, actual uh, work they do with contractors. So we're hoping to announce some of those uh, in the near future and also uh, for mental health support uh, in construction, which is obviously really uh, important at this moment in time. Um, so on to John uh, presentation. So a few uh, quick notes about John. So John uh, was appointed as the first chief executive officer of the Australian Constructors Association on the 1st of July 2020 uh, after leading the Queensland Major Contractors Association uh, for two years. Uh, John's got over 30 years experience uh, in the construction industry. Uh, supporting uh, the successful commercial delivery of projects in Australia, uh, the Middle East, UK and Asia. Uh, John is passionate uh, advocate for change. Uh, he's driven by a desire to ensure that every level of the industry uh, is sustainable, uh, resilient to boom and bust cycles, and to deliver the infrastructure society needs in a collaborative and uh, efficient manner. So uh, John will be giving us a presentation on the case for an Australian construction playbook, uh, which is something that's happened in, in, in the UK. And uh, given time, John will also give us a, a couple of updates from the ACA with uh, you know, the latest uh, lockdown uh, in, in New South Wales. So on that note, I'll hand over to John. Yeah, thanks very much, David, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a real shame that uh, we can't all be together, uh, especially enjoying a, a drink or two. Hopefully, you've, you've maybe got a, a, a drink readily to hand. Um, uh, with some of the news I've got, you might actually need that, unfortunately, but um, there are some positive aspects of, uh, of what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, please feel free, as Sarah said at the start, um, to add any questions into the Q&A box. Um, there will be a reasonable opportunity at the end to, uh, to answer any questions that you've got. Um, I'm generally quite happy to, to answer uh, things on just about it, anything. Um, 
apart from Middlesbrough Football Club. But uh, other than that, it's 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 fair game. So without that, I'm going to um, start um, and talk about the case for, for for reform. And really, I want to set out a little bit of context for everyone. I'm sure uh, for for a lot of you, this isn't uh, isn't news um, that that you, you're aware of some of this, but. Construction is really integral to the economy here in Australia. We account in for almost one in 10 of the working population. Um, we're the third largest industry in Australia, and we contribute anywhere between seven and 8% uh, to GDP. But unfortunately, we've got a few problems as an industry. Um, there's some press clippings that you see on the screen there that highlight some of the major uh, project issues that we've seen um, uh, in more recent years. But unfortunately, these sorts of headlines are pretty commonplace. Um, they're, they're, they're happening all, all the time. We've got quite a few challenges as an industry. From a productivity standpoint, if you look at productivity growth and compare productivity growth between construction and other major industries over the last 30 years, construction lags other major industries by 25%. You hear a lot uh, about contractors talking about a profitless boom, and no, it's not just contractors whinging, although I know we are quite uh, inclined to, to, to whinge a lot, uh, second only to farmers, I think, in terms of whinging. Uh, but this is actually a reality. Um, if you look at the Australian Bureau of Statistics, you will see that um, the construction industry or businesses in the construction sector account for almost 25% of all business insolvencies in Australia. We have a boom and bust investment cycle. Um, we go Booms are just as bad as busts for the construction industry. They, they introduce shortages, uh, which cause price rises, which cause uh, particular issues. So booms, busts, they're all bad. We need to try to find a way to smooth the pipeline of works out. We've also seen over the last few years uh, a significant rise in the number of mega projects um, that are constructed here in Australia. I think, you know, if I was speaking to you five years ago and, and uh, you know, we we're talking about a billion dollar project or a two billion dollar project, everyone will be going, wow, you know, a two billion dollar project. Wow, that's uh, that's that's really a big project. That's something special. Nowadays, we hardly get excited by a $5 billion project, and we see increasing numbers of these coming to market. And this is a problem um, because these projects are very complex. Um, they're very risky. And certainly from a contractor perspective, I don't think anyone's figured out just yet how to make any money out of them. As an industry, we've, we've also got a gender problem. Only 12% of our workforce are female. And if we go to blue collar, that number dwindles down to a measly 2 or 3%. We've also got a very uh, significant mental health problem. Um, a very shocking statistic is that our workers are six times more likely to die from suicide than they are from a workplace incident. And if that were not all bad enough, um, along came COVID. And whilst as an industry, we, we actually had a pretty good start to the pandemic in terms of we didn't shut down, we kept sites open, it actually increased collaboration and trust between some of the industry stakeholders where over the last 10, 20 years, there'd been a significant deterioration in collaboration and trust. So I'm talking about unions. Industry work very closely with unions to keep project sites open and work very closely with clients to expedite projects and to get boots on the ground. 
And that has continued fairly well, I think, for a period of time until unfortunately um, a few weeks ago where we saw the New South Wales government uh, take uh, a very interesting decision to, to close down construction. First um, significant jurisdiction in Australia to do so, and that's had a massive impact on our industry. Um, currently, just to provide everyone uh, a, a, a small update, I uh, just came from a meeting this afternoon um, with Infrastructure New South Wales. We have been advised that there will be an announcement tomorrow um, uh, to confirm the construction will reopen on the 31st of this month. So that's on Saturday. Um, would they will also be providing an opportunity to undertake um, limited restart, uh, pre-start works um, to enable a, as, as best as possible a, a smooth start on the 31st. The problem that there is going to be with all of this is that there are still going to be significant restrictions placed on movement of people from um, five key L LGAs and some analysis that we've undertaken shows that anywhere between 30 and 60 percent of construction workforces come from those five LGAs. So we're going to see significant disruption to project sites for quite some time to come. So COVID is providing challenges now, particularly now, but COVID is also providing an opportunity. If we talk about productivity alone and we look at and say, well, look, those issues that I talked about at the start, if we can address them, if we can address and improve the sustainability of the construction industry, what opportunities do we have? Well, from a productivity standpoint alone, I talked just earlier there about a 25% gap in productivity growth over the last 30 years between construction and other major industries. What does that actually mean? Let, let's, let's try and put that into context. Well, the context of that is if we were just to half that gap, let's not get too ambitious, too carried away with ourselves here. Let's just look to half that gap. If we could do that, we could be constructing an extra 15 billion dollars worth of work every single year for the same level of investment or employing an extra 15,000 people. If we didn't want to spend that extra money in construction, what, what would that, that sort of look like? Well, if we look at the last budget here in Australia and the uh, treasurer committed, I think it was something like $9 billion to fix issues in aged care. And that's $9 billion over four years. We could pay for that in less than a year. But from a construction standpoint, what does $15 billion look like? That's one inland rail project, more than one inland rail project every year, or just under three Western Sydney airports. So this opportunity is significant. So if we all agree on what uh, on the need for a sustainable construction industry and i'm pleased to say that um, so far in all of the conversations i've been having i don't think i've come across anyone that that doesn't agree that a sustainable industry is a good thing what does a sustainable construction industry look like what are the key components of a sustainable construction industry well back in 2017 um, aca and the New South Wales and Victorian governments came together to create the Construction Industry Leadership Forum, which was specifically uh, done to try to address some of the issues that, that everyone could see um, that were present in the industry. And largely out of the conversations of the Construction Industry Leadership Forum, this model um, came about. And it's, as you can see, it's not a difficult model. It's, it's actually quite a simple model. And it is it involves three key pillars. One is improved industry culture, another is sufficient capability, capacity, and skills. And then finally, equitable and aligned commercial frameworks. All of those three things, importantly, 
are all interlinked. If you want a sustainable industry, you can't just say, oh, well, you know, okay, let's let, let's just go and fix the, the contracts. Let's let's just wheel out a whole load of alliance contracts and everything will be fine. That's not going to work. Best example I can give of, of how all of these three, these three pillars are interlinked is if we look at the commercial frameworks that we've been utilizing over the last 10 years, they've driven a very and created a very adversarial culture in our in industry. And that adversarial culture is now impacting on our ability to attract and retain the people that we need into our industry to undertake the pipeline of work that's ahead of us. So for just to focus on the culture component of this um, for, for a minute, um, what are we doing? What can we do around addressing industry culture? I mean, it's a huge problem. How, how, how do you, where do you start addressing and changing the culture of any industry, let alone the construction industry? Well, very early days of the construction industry leadership forum, everyone agreed that yes, this was a big problem and it was such a big problem that really we needed to set up a forum, a body just to look at this particular problem and, and what are we going to do about it? So the construction industry culture task force was formed. And again, the main players in that are ACA, the New South Wales government and the Victorian government. But interestingly and importantly, there were another other, a few other key stakeholders that were involved in this that um, there are uh, academics, for example, and I'll explain their role later, but also important key players. Um, uh, one significant player will be Alison Myers from Robertson Co, who's very passionate and, and doing a lot with her own business around trying to address the root causes of poor industry culture. But one of the main things that the Construction Industry Culture Task Force is looking to do is to develop a culture standard. This isn't your, you know, your sort of typical uh, like charter that you'd sign at the start of an alliance, a one page charter where everyone agrees, yes, we're going to do this, this, we're going to do that, and everyone then forgets about it and goes about their business as normal. This is actually going to be quite a detailed prescriptive document that will focus on those three key focus areas that you see on that slide there now. So diversity and inclusion, time for life and improved well-being. And the aim with all of this is to, this, this can have impacts on productivity. It can help with the attraction retention piece. Um, from a customer perspective, we can improve capability and capacity. Um, and that in turn will enable us to be better placed to help with economic recovery. And from a worker perspective, improved quality of life, better health and well-being, and feeling valued in what um, what they're doing. So, what is the culture standard? What what will what it what will it try to do? Well, it's going to try to establish a standard approach to improve practices and. It's going to um, ideally the the um, it's going to be adopted by especially government clients, um, and it's going to be, become part of procurement processes. So it's going to be a requirement for industry to industry will have to comply with what's included in this um, culture standard. Um, what, what we're going to do as well is the from an academic perspective, we're going to track and monitor how the changes to culture and the changes to the specific aspects of culture through the implementation of the culture standard so that we can demonstrate, hopefully demonstrate that, that this is actually working. So I'll just flick back there, I thought I had another slide. So some specific things that we're gonna to look to do with that culture standard, this will be about things like mandating a five day working week would be one looking at addressing gender pay gaps, improve, increasing um, the, the percentage of women in construction, 
part of that will be achieved and the whole range of things that we'll look to to achieve that but we'll look to improve site facilities for example i noticed at the weekend the new south wales building commissioner posted something on linkedin specifically around this issue and some of the still quite woeful facilities that we that we have on some of our construction sites By the way, I'm not seeing any questions coming in yet, so please keep, get, get, get your question, questions in because I'll be interested to, to answer them later on. So just moving on, so then we get into the commercial frameworks and, and a key element of those commercial frameworks and how we improve those commercial frameworks is around collaboration. And this particular side sums it all up for me, especially when we're talking about risk. What we've seen in the past is a view that from from clients that they can transfer all of this risk onto contractors every single risk that there is going and there's no comeback to them well this picture summarizes that that's not the case and the reason that's not the case is because there's one risk that clients cannot transfer to contractors and if i was in in person within the room i'd ask you to all uh, suggest to me what you think that risk is, but um, as, as we're not, I'll tell you. That risk is reputational risk. So what happens when things go south on a project? Contractor says, yes, I'll price all of that risk. I'll accept all of that risk. The contract's written. The client engages a nice expensive lawyer and drafts a very thick contract that covers off on all of these risks. These risks come to pass. The contractor finds itself in a world of hurt starts to try to mitigate its loss, things start slowing down on site. What happens next? What happens next is those other stakeholders, the general public, start to get a bit uh, frustrated. The shopkeepers in George Street, for example, on, uh, on um, Sydney Light Rail, they say, well, well you've told us we were only going to be uh, our work, our business was only going to be disturbed for a year, but here we are 18 months later and, and it's still disturbed. Who do you think that they go and complain to about that? It's certainly not the contractor. It's the client. So there's always an election around the corner. The client is put in a position where ultimately they have to go back to the contractor and say, well, you know, that big thick contract that we may sign that passed all the risk over to you or can we just park that can we just put that to one side can we talk about how we make the pain go away and that's back to that picture there ultimately you can't escape it no one can escape it so if we can't escape it then it's in our interest to work together to find the best way to deal with it the best way to manage it to deliver the best outcome to align the interests of all the parties to a construction contract to achieve an agreed set of outcomes. So this sort of brings me on now, I guess, to the, the, the main point of the discussion. We, we have a situation now where the COVID opportunity, um, the COVID opportunity is the fact that we have a government that has invested record amount of money in infrastructure on the basis the the, the well-known economic basis that um, every dollar spent on infrastructure is a three dollar kick on to the wider economy so here we are record level investment 110 billion dollar investment by the commonwealth in infrastructure so they're very much relying on the construction industry to do the economic heavy lifting um, uh, of economic repair following the covid recession but that industry, as I talked to before, has significant issues. There's real concerns around capability, capacity and skills. We can't address them like we normally do by just flying a whole load of people um, in, adjusting our visa settings and bringing a whole lot of people in because the borders are shut and the borders are likely to be shut, let's face it, for still some time to come. And even when they open again, what we'll see is a huge competition for those resources because every similar jurisdiction around the world is doing exactly the same thing as we are they're all spending big on infrastructure and 
Yes, we have a few uh, advantages down here in Australia, a few natural advantages in terms of it being a nice place that people want to come to. But is that going to be sufficient to attract the number of people that we need to down here to undertake that work? Probably not. So what can we do? We can't train people up quickly enough. It takes six, seven years to train an engineer. Well, a couple of things we can do. One of the things is we can address the culture problem. We can look to attract back into our industry those people that have gone, you know what? Don't like construction. I'm going to move off. I'm going to do something else because of the hours, because of the conditions or whatever that might be. We need to attract back that half the working population that currently decides that construction is not a place they want to work, i.e. women. But also, this is where the productivity piece comes back into play as well, because there's a significant opportunity to do more for less. Whilst that will have undoubtedly a financial benefit, it can also help address this capability and capacity issue. So what we've been saying to government is, you need to do something here. We've all, of course, we've been talking to the state governments. We, 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 we have the construction industry leadership forum where we're talking to the New South Wales and Victorian governments on an ongoing basis. And that has delivered some positive results. Just recently from a, from a New South Wales perspective, we saw a directive to delivery agencies outlining um, key elements, um, key focus areas, areas of collaboration that they uh, wanted those delivery agencies to implement, um, which was a very positive step, which was a result of the conversations that we've been having with them. We've also seen uh, recently um, we, we organised a workshop between the delivery agencies and their external legal counsel to talk around contract complexity, contract standardisation, and that's likely to uh, lead to a set of agreed principles around contract drafting and certain agreed um, commercial positions that will be incorporated into all contracts going forward. So all really positive stuff. We're seeing um, in Victoria some positive stuff with, if we look at the level crossing removal program, delivering excellent outcomes. We're seeing the MRPV um, panel approach, delivering excellent outcomes. And we saw very significantly the decision with the Northeast Link project to um, stop a very traditional PPP procurement process halfway through and change to one that had an incentivized target cost model at the center of it. I've been in the industry 30 years and I've never seen that happen before. So it's a real positive stuff, but it's not happening quickly enough and it's not happening consistently enough if we're to address the problems that we need to address to avoid there being any delay, any threat to the delivery of that $110 billion pipeline of work. So what we're saying to the federal government is, you need to be invested in this. You need, you've got a role to play in all of this. And what we've been saying is that, look, as an industry, we know what the problems are. Just been talking about the problems just now. There's no dispute around what those problems are. Largely, there's also no dispute as to what the solutions to those problems are. The problem is that we've just got to find a way to get on and actually implement change to do this. And I must admit, I was sort of struggling um, uh, last year with, uh, with how to uh, overcome this particular problem. And then the UK government in December of last year published a construction playbook. So what is a construction playbook? A construction playbook is essentially a home for best practice. It, the, the, U, the, the construction playbook in the UK documents best practice um, procurement and delivery processes. And the UK government have said to all of their delivery agencies, you've got to use this, you've got to follow this or explain why not. This was developed in conjunction with the Construction Leadership Council, which is um, an umbrella organization that pulls together a lot of different construction related industry associations. It was pulled together in under one year and is already starting to be implemented now. So we thought, ah, that's a great idea. That's a great concept. 
why don't we start to to talk to the government here about um, introducing something similar here? And we even went to the extent of um, of engaging a, a graphic designer to mock us up um, our own playbook cover. And off we went to talk to, to the federal government about this. And there was a degree of interest there, um, but ultimately the what was played back to us was, well, John, you do realize that the, um, uh, the UK is a different system of government to, to what we have here in, in Australia. Can you give us some examples of where this has worked in other jurisdictions that have similar systems of governance? Fine, no problem. How's about Canada? How's about United States? What about France? Or even look at what they do in the European Union. Okay, it's not uh, a, a directly analogous, but it is a system whereby a body is seeking to um, put preconditions on spend by directly elected um, governments. So the, the, the federal government here started to take some interest in that, but ultimately, and there was some interest in, the, in, in that from the states, um, but significantly there was some pushback from uh, a number of states. And so what I can update you on currently is that um, what the federal government is looking to do is to potentially incentivize or, or play a coordinating role in um, bringing together best practice, maybe not documenting that best practice in terms of a playbook, but certainly bringing it together, playing a role in facilitating the sharing of best practice and potentially the trialing of best practice on a number of projects. Um, they have set up um, uh, an interesting department, uh, sounds like something out of James Bond, it's called SPIDO. SPIDO stands for the Significant Project Investment Delivery Office. Um, I think if you Google that, you'll go to a web page that will tell you just that and will tell you who's heading that up. But uh, last time I looked, there's very little information other than that. But what that um, I believe is looking to do is to trial some areas of best practice. That best practice could be, let's look at implementing a culture standard on a project. Let's look at trialing NEC contracts on a, on, on a number of projects. Let's look at a different way of dealing with risk. There's, a, there's a, a range of areas that they are currently looking at. And quite interestingly also, I don't know, uh, some of you may have seen at the weekend, um, I, I don't want to rub this in because most of you are from Sydney, but up here in Brisbane, we, we've been granted uh, permission to host the Olympics in, in 2032. And um, everyone up here is quite excited about that because it means that we might get some infrastructure built. Um, but the uh, federal government have been quite cute um, with this in terms of granting the, uh, that their funding commitment is conditional on the fact that they ha actually have a say in how that money is spent. And what we could start to see is that that becomes actually a precedent um, and the federal government looks to become more involved in that going forward. And on this slide here, you can see the Australian um, Infrastructure Australia's uh, Infrastructure Plan. So that's a five year reviewed on a five year cycle. Ultimately, what that does is it talks about and recommends um, reform of how projects are procured and delivered. Um, we are, the, the, the next version of this is going to be published in um, the next few weeks, hopefully. Um, we understand that it will have a whole bunch of recommendations that we will agree with. Um, but the trick with this is going to be, the problem with this is going to be the 2016 plan similarly had, you know, a number of reform initiatives in there. Um, but ultimately they weren't adopted because there was no uh, requirement for the states to do so. So this is another reason why we think that the federal government is potentially going to take more of an active role this time round. And just to give them a bit of a, a, a move on and the joys of working from home, I've got a spaniel wanting to be let into my office. So I'll just uh, sort that out. Um, so what we're seeing is um, they, they've also uh, had a, a, or opened up a procurement reform 
a panel in, panel of inquiry, a federal procurement panel of inquiry, where they call for um, submissions to um, this in terms of what are the problems and what are the solutions to just, just what I've talk, been talking about today. Some of it has been sort of framed around sovereign capability, um, but largely it's it's around what are the problems and what can we do about it? So quite interestingly, I think quite significantly, um, the an industry, a whole of industry coalition came together to write a letter, which hopefully a lot of you will have seen. If you haven't seen this, please go to our website or go to our LinkedIn feed. And what um, that letter there was a letter that was signed by 14 industry associations and those 14 industry associations all came together to call for the federal government to play a more active role in all of this. And we specifically followed up with that that you can see the front cover of our submission there. You can actually read our submission now that's been cleared for uh, for people to go on and have a look at. And uh, in fact, I think there's a, a LinkedIn post that we've posted a link on that today so that you can go and have, um, have a read of that. And I really encourage you to do that. And in terms of recommendations in the specific recommendations that we had in there was that, as I said uh, before, federal government to coordinate and incentivize procurement reform. And amongst that to mandate a requirement for a positive cash flow. It always amazes me that the government, when the government goes out and buys a warship, they don't pay for the warship on 60 days payment terms. And yet we have these billion dollar projects, multi-billion dollar projects, where industry is required to finance the government. We've got to move on from that. We need to establish a whole of government agency to develop a standard suite of contracts in our view. Either that could be adopting uh, something that's already out there, like an NEC or a FIDIC, but we've got to make some progress in this area in terms of mandating standard forms of contract. Um, we also believe that a culture standard is really important for the reasons I highlighted before, and we're calling for the government to mandate that culture standard. And critically and, and importantly, and this was a key uh, component of the UK playbook, um, an agreement that projects should be procured based on the best value to the taxpayer, not on lowest cost, not on lowest tender cost, because the, the two quite often are quite are not the same thing. And one of the initiatives of the construction industry leadership forum this year will be to try to develop a framework which will better define value for money other than just that lowest cost. So just to, 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 to wrap up there, um, I've gone through a heck of a lot of information there, uh, mindful of that, and please have a look. If you wanna find out more, please go to our website. You will find a page that talks all about reform, has links to all of the documents um, that I've talked about. But really what I wanna finish on before I go into questions is just to say that, look, we all agree that a sustainable industry is a good thing and you all can play a part in achieving that sustainable construction industry. You're all out there in different sectors, different areas of our industry. Please challenge the status quo, push the change, get involved, get informed. It's in all our interests to do that. And we have a great opportunity. If we all do that, we really do have a great opportunity to achieve real and lasting reform for our industry, for the benefit of our industry going forward. So at that point, I'm going to open the chat box and, and hope I'm going to see some questions. Um, so, OK, I'm going to pick the first one off the list. So the first question I'm reading out. How do you propose the risk of claims be mitigated between contractors and consultants given the different market circumstances you described? Project PI insurance is getting increasingly difficult to obtain, which doesn't help this growing situation. Look, absolutely, I completely agree with you. We, um, as an industry association, since I came on board, have made a point of reaching out to other industry associations to look at specific um, improve, improving collaboration and relationships between specific sectors of our industry. And one of those key relationships 
is the relationship between contractors and designers. So um, I've spent a lot of time working with Nicola Grayson at Consult Australia on a number of key issues between us. That project PI insurance one is of particular concern. And coming back to the reason again, why the federal government needs to get invested in and involved in reform is to address P, uh, specific issues like PI insurance uh, and the availability of PI insurance. And we are starting to see signs that they, they, they do want to do something about that. The next question I've got is, you have referred to the adversarial culturing projects. Is there a role for NEC to play? It has been shown over many years that a number of revisions um, produce uh, less adversarial um, outcomes. Yes, um, the short answer to that one, uh, again, is yes, we do believe that, that contracts like NEC do have a role to play. Um, we're, we're seeing certain uh, clients adopt them slowly. Um, the, the, the best example, which most of you will be aware of, will be Sydney Water. But uh, even private sector clients like Santos are, lo are looking at it as well. Um, I think the key with this is not to get hung up on, on the exact form of contract, but, but the, the, the principles that are embedded with, within that contract. And um, unfortunately, it is a reality that uh, our states um, um, are very protective um, of their, um, their standard forms of contract. And I think it's going to be very difficult to, to get some standardization there, but I think the first step really is to try to get embedded into those existing uh, forms of contract, um, excuse me, more, more collaborative uh, principles. And obviously the NEC form of contract um, has, has some great examples of how that can be done. Next question, in discussions with government, is there any feedback on changing contracts to become more collaborative? Oh, okay, so that's another uh, question. So, yeah, look, ultimately the answer is yes. And, and I, I'd sort of come back, the great, the great example of that one will be um, the conversations that we're having with Infrastructure New South Wales and um, that workshop that we had with their external legal counsel. Um, they do want to see more collaborative principles embedded into into construction contracts, and we're hopeful. Um, unfortunately, this recent shutdown and and um, and the the activity that that has generated behind the scenes between us and and uh, and government trying to resolve those particular issues has, has sort of put a pause on that. But we we are hopeful that um, in in weeks, um, not months we will agree certain principles that will um, ultimately be agreed to be incorporated into construction contracts that will be coming out the door um, um, between now and the end of uh, between now and the end of this year uh, big task when we cannot get security of payment the same in each state i think well i think that's a, a comment around this the standardization um, issue yeah look um, unfortunately, our states are very parochial and, and trying to get them to agree to, to anything is, um, is, is problematic. But I think that there is this opportunity here now um, to get a forum where we encourage um, standardization um, across a range of issues um, on the basis of it being best practice. I think if we if we get a, a forum whereby the states can share what they're doing, we can pick specific issues, uh, whether that be security of payment, whether that be uh, risk, wh whatever that might be, that, that we then talk about that particular topic. We, we share best practice um, between ourselves, between the states, between uh, other industry stakeholders, and we encourage um, adoption of that best practice. I think that that is probably the path of least resistance to try to get some change in some of these areas. Um, what have I got next? At the early stages of major infrastructure projects, NEC was suggested as an appropriate form of contract to consider. As far as I could tell, it was opposed by the legal profession. Look, I, I think um, just on the legal profession bit, um, 
Uh, I, look, I'm going to be controversial here because I can. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm here representing contractors, not lawyers. Um, and, and, and there has been, for sure, our observation will be that there are some vested interests, historically have been some vested interests in not challenging the status quo. But I will say, and, and, and positively, we are seeing significant movement away from that. And I'm not just going to say this because they're sponsoring um, this particular webinar, but, uh, but um, Robert Pinson Mason um, has, has been leading the charge in this area. Owen Hayford um, will be another one I'd, I'd, I'd point to um, as, as be, being leading the charge. I was in, we had a conversation, another webinar um, a, a few uh, few months ago now um, by the Hard Convo um, uh, gang. Uh, hopefully they're going to be uh, doing another webinar soon, and it was entitled. Uh, it was titled, "Is it time to pump the lawyers?" And um, very controversially titled, but um, I'm pleased to say, actually pleased to say that uh, we all agreed that it wasn't time to pump the lawyers, but we did agree that um, there was significant uh, change was required, but change was starting to happen in that area. Um. Next up, what do we have? We have in discussion with government, what is the appetite level for investigating risk allocation downstream? Often sub consultants are asked to take on disproportionate risk allocation proportions to what work they're undertaking. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all well and good for me to sit here and and and, and talk and, uh, about um, things from a from a contract, a head contractor's uh, perspective. I mean, our membership. It does cross the three sectors of horizontal, vertical, and construction services, but um, we we are the bigger end of town. Our members are the larger contractors, but we do have an obligation to look after and support the supply chain. We are reliant on the supply chain, and uh, what I'd ask you to do and, uh, uh, is to have a look again through our website. You can find it at the ten commitments that we came out with ourselves at the end of last year, recognizing that there is a whole bunch of things that we can do ourselves without waiting for government and the things that we should do ourselves and, and we will be looking to do. Um, and, it, and it covers things like risk allocation and, and, um, and, and supporting the supply chain. Uh, next question. Uh, well done on the work that I see it. Thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, uh, appreciate the feedback. Uh, why have the state and federal governments been so resistant to construction industry change? Do you see this resistance reducing more quickly the more work you do with them? Look, absolutely. Um, I, I think uh, I've already said this. Please, if, you, if you're going to take away something from, from this webinar, take away the fact that change is possible we do it this is not just um saying it for the sake of saying it and you know we we hear this expression all the time once in a generation opportunity we really do have a significant opportunity here there are so many things that are coming together serendipitously here and okay some of them are not good things that like covid but there will be can be positive impact out of all this. We are seeing people that wouldn't talk about change before, who were reluctant to talk about change, talking about change. And OK, some of that is driven by the fact that it's essentially because of the large amount of work that's out there, it can be deemed and called a contractor's market currently. And the conversation I had with the Queensland government recently, I said, look, we, we're battling with the Queensland government at the minute around something uh, called the best practice industrial um, conditions, which uh, which is a bit of an oxymoron if ever there was one. But what what we've said with that is that, look, we don't want to put it in, in these terms, but ultimately um, it is a contractor's market. We want to see this change. But we don't want this. This is a change and the changes that we're looking for are changes that will benefit everyone. They will benefit contractors, but they will benefit the supply chain. They will benefit design consultants. They will benefit taxpayers. They will benefit end users. They will benefit everyone. 
The trick with all of this is going to be ensuring that we lock in these changes that we will we are hopeful we will see such that when we go when i talked about before the boom and bust cycles as in inevitably we will at some stage move down the cycle and move back towards lower levels of work that we don't see a return to the bad old days of saying oh, okay well it's my it, it, it's my turn now um, uh, they, they've been um, taking advantage of the situation. Uh, it's my turn to 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 get something back out out of all this and, and recover um, some of the money that I've paid out over the last five, ten years, whatever it may be. And, and we've all seen those attitudes before. We've all seen that on all sides of the fence. And I've got to admit, from a construction standpoint, from a contractor standpoint, we're guilty of that. We've got to put our hands up. We've got to move forward. We've got to build trust. We've got to move away from that pendulum that we've seen. I've seen all the time I've been in my career, that 30 years of, of moving backwards and forwards and decisions around the form of contract being taken based on what stage we are in the market cycle, rather than what are the specific issues and circumstances around that project. That's the, the, the what we should be basing our decision on around whether we go with a lump sum DNC, whether we go with construct only, whether we go with a um, uh, incentivized target cost or an alliance contract, not whether it's a contractor's market or a client's market. Right, I think um, it, uh, I think I'll probably come to the end of the questions, which is probably not bad timing there. So I'll, I'll probably, um, if there's no more questions, I'll probably throw back to uh, to, to you, David. Okay, thanks very much, John. So I'd, I'd just like to, uh, on behalf of the Lighthouse Club, thank John for a very good presentation and for some uh, very up-to-date feedback from his discussions uh, with, with government. Um, the ACA just does an enormous job to promote uh, the interests of the contractors in Australia. And John, it'd be really good to get you back in the new year and, and, and just get a, an, an update on you know, how, how you're getting on with the collaborative contracts, discussions, and, and all the other challenges that you're dealing with on a on day-to-day on a, on a -day issue there. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to, David, yeah, because I, I, I'm hoping that there will be a lot to report on. Yeah, I bet. So we're looking forward to the announcement tomorrow um, on opening up construction at the end of the month. And for all the participants who are, are listening in, please do keep an eye on your email and the LinkedIn adverts uh, we send out for our monthly events. Uh, they're always well attended. And obviously we're trying to keep them going through the, uh, the COVID pandemic and your support is greatly appreciated. And it all goes through to uh, helping us raise funds uh, for some really good causes, uh, which are all construction based. So on that note, I'll say goodbye to everyone. And thanks John and see you in the new year. Thanks, everyone. That concludes today's webinar. You may now disconnect. Speakers, please stand by. Thank you.